This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. At Sax.com, it's easy to find your new vibe. Dive into the Western trend with gold cowboy boots from Stott. Or go full 90s throwback with platforms from Prada. You can shop for everything on your agenda. Whether it's a breezy Zimmerman dress for a garden party or a bright Chloe blazer for brunch. Find inspiration for your new vibe. Every day at Saks.com. Hello and welcome back to First Act, a podcast from Koshy's Business Builders. I'm Sess Busby. And I'm Adam Bubb. Now, Adam, are you ready to take a deep dive into another origin story of one of Australia's most innovative movers and shakers in business and life? I was born ready, Sess. First Act is all about people who have taken the roads less travelled and created brands that have made an impact. Last week, we spoke to a self-proclaimed corporate escapee. Make sure you listen to Michelle Fotheringham's unmissable episode of First Act. It's fantastic, even if I don't say so myself. And don't forget to pop a review for us if you like what you hear. It helps us reach more ears. We love that. Sess, tell me about today's guest. She's flown high from her nest. (laughs) <laughs> now, when it comes to retail, our next guest, Jane Kay, knows a thing or two. She's one of Australia's leading fashion retailers and has grown her business from a small boutique store in Country Cooma to an online empire with over 150 staff. Yet retail was never the original plan for Jane. It wasn't till she fell in love and returned to the snowy mountain ranges that she now calls home that this accidental entrepreneur really found her calling and her business Bird's Nest was born. Now, Jane is here today to share some of that journey with us and reveal why Bird's Nest is still flying high after all these years. Welcome. Oh, hello. So good to be here, Sess and Adam. Thank you for having me. Jane, it's so great to have you with us today. Uh, We always start with our first act, Icebreaker. So your Uh icebreaker for today is, drumroll... If you could choose one <laughs> song as your personal theme song, what would it be? My personal theme song? Just something that jeez you up, that really gets you going or, or, or that says something about who you are. <laughs> I feel like I should be coming up with something profound, but, of course, you know, when one thing just gets into you, I've just, yeah, one song has just got into my head that I, um, that was probably my my my. First favourite song. Um, it's a classic Cindy Lauper, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Um, oh, it had a matching movie. I don't know if you saw the movie. It came out in the mid-'80s, Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Yes. Anyway, had, uh, yes. Um, what's her name? Helen Hunt, Mad About You. <gasps> Helen Hunt and Sarah Jessica Parker. Yes. It was an awesome team flick and a, a lot of dancing and I do love to dance um, and yeah, I guess it's turned out that, um, you know, I have built a life around, um, you know, making women feel good about themselves so they can go out and have fun. And sometimes maybe I probably need to remind myself to have a bit more fun and not take it all too seriously. So, yes, I think that could be a good one. It seems a bit trivial, but <laughs> girls just want to have fun. Cindy Lauper. I think I might have spied on your website for Bird's Nest that Dance Together is one of your values, one of your company values. Am, is that right? Yeah, so Dance Together, I guess, for us is all about, yeah, remembering to cultivate that that joy. I think, you know, sometimes we can get so serious in what we do, even when you're, you know, selling frocks for a living. Sometimes, you know, the things that come up and crop up, life can become stressful and I think we that one of our values is, is, is Dance Together, which is, you know, metaphorically we do do a lot of dancing together. We ha- sometimes have a no lights, no lycra night and <laughs> we love to dance. We always have excellent band um at our christmas party that we're famous for it so yes we we actually get on the dance floor um but also i think it, it's a good reminder for us all to um to 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 cultivate those moments that and 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 concentrate on also bringing joy into the daily into the work into the workplace <laughs> and sell frocks at the same time <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> now you live on a farm in Cooma in New South Wales, beautiful snowy mountains. What's the best thing about living there? 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So I live on a farm, um, a sheep, it's a working sheep farm. Um, I married a boy in a big cowboy hat. We're 65 k south of Cooma. So it's actually, it's an hour and a half round trip to get a carton of milk where I live. Um, ah. One of the best, <laughs> yeah. we have a lot of milk in the freezer, I tell you, Seth. Um, <laughs> but one of the best bits I think is that you can definitely stay in your pyjamas all day. No one's going to call in. Um, but, you know, the fact that we, re- you know, we've been here since 2002 and really to be able to design your lifestyle and have this beautiful, you know, um, I, I often say, you know, we get to live in the slow lane, yet I still get to have a career and a, a life in the fast lane um, professionally. So, you know, the fact that we can have the best of both of those worlds, I think, is something we've probably all begun to realise in the last couple of years and, and you know, we are seeing that tree change. Um, other people are cottoning on to this great idea. Uh, yeah, and we've, I guess, been, I feel like I've been living the dream for, 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 you know, well, yeah, that's 20 years now, actually. Yeah, there you go. God, how lucky are you? I know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> But you know, for like for us, for us city, us city slickers, you know, sitting here in in the inner inner Sydney, um, we're in sitting our here, sweaty cubicle, in our sweaty cubicle. <laughs> 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 we are naturally quite curious about what living in that farm, that farm homestead dream looks like. Like, what does it smell like every day? What does it sound like? I'm sure it's, it, it's probably it feels so different. And yet, you are really not that far. Like you said, you know, you're not really that far from cities because you know within a drive a driving distance. But I suppose it is. What is that? What does that average day look like for you? Does it start with a cockadoodle do? <laughs> Pretty much. We have at the, we've had three roosters vying for attention at the moment. So in the mornings, they all kind of try to outdo each other. Um, <laughs> was an accident. You don't normally have three roosters, but we we had a chicken that had eggs, and unfortunately, she had she gave birth to all roosters. Anyway, um, so yes, it does literally start with those kind of noises. Um, we're always up early in our household. Um, I love to go for a walk. And I think, you know, the transition, because I, I actually lived in Sydney for a while, so I used to do that, you know, that beautiful Coogee to um, Bondi-type walk along there. And I thought when I moved to the country my life had ended. <laughs> and here I had this dirt road to walk along and I thought of no people to look at. And honestly, I can honestly say that every day, you know, I get to the top of the hill where where, where our mailbox is, which is about a K from our house, and I look out across these beautiful mountains from where I am. You can see to Victoria, you can see the snowy mountains, and then you can see across to this beautiful wind. Um, there's a wind farm and it's just stunning in the mornings as the sun's rising and, you know, the mountains and the country air and nature just has that thing. It just gives you that sense of awe and it can do that every morning with exactly the same scene. I feel like I see something new. So I think it's a really, it is a healthy way to start the day, 100%. Um, you know, but and hopefully, you know, even in the cities, we can ac- we can still continue to access that nature in in places um, because it does give us all such a you know. I think we're born to be to be amongst it. It sounds so idyllic. Whatever made you leave? Because you, <laughs> as you said, you're a country girl, but then you moved to the big smoke. What made you move to the big smoke when you finished school? So let me say oh big gosh, smoke. I couldn't wait. I'm just going to say big smoke again. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's what I would say to Sydney. Um, I mean, I could not wait to get out of here. I, honestly, I finished school. I told mum, look, I'm heading, you know, to Sydney to study, which of course they were encouraging and, and pleased for me, but I really had no conception that I would be back. And actually specifically, I, I remember saying, mum, I would never marry a farmer. That life just looks so hard. We, I was a townie. We grew up in town. So I, I didn't grow up on the land. Um, and yeah, I, I just thought all the, all the opportunities, both education and career wise were in the city, uh, at that time. And I think, you know, I think the world has really changed since then. You know, we're seeing a lot of kids in regional areas being able to access because a lot of it was at the cost of having to go to Sydney to Sydney and to be able to support yourself while being while studying was was huge for rural kids. And what the digital and the internet age has brought is, you know, that accessibility to, to regional areas is is much better now. Yeah, that's such an important point because, you know, it's that thing of going where you live shouldn't be uh, standing in the way of your dreams and what you want to achieve and, and how you achieve them. And, I, and technology has played a real role in being able to to give that access to people wherever you are to, to, to you know, 
to dream as big as you want to. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a girl that left school not being able to turn a computer on. I honestly thought that technology and computers were for complete nerds or the male population. I I really, you know, I wanted a creative career, a really, you know, um, interesting career. And I didn't think technology or computers would have it. I think computers was really what we called it then. (laughs) Um, And I remember my first shoot at uni having to put like a, they said, put the floppy disk in. And I didn't, I mean, I didn't even know what a floppy disk was. So you know what? Really to, to your credit, your... a lot of this generation now probably don't, or at least are going, what is a floppy <laughs> disk? Like, yes, well, they floppy don't disc. know what it is now either. <laughs> so, you know. I know. I, I'm so, I'm feeling so old. Yeah, so, th- I mean, when I hit that, the big smoke and, and, and university, I think that's, like, it really opened my eyes to the opportunity and I arrived at university in 19... 19- 96 so that was like we were all getting our first hotmail addresses and um the internet was becoming kind of this mainstream thing and we were like whoa and I remember just thinking holy smokes this thing is going to change the game it's going to change the way not only the way we were learning and um you know shopping and 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 um interacting with each other and socializing and dating but also completely changed the business world which is what I went off to study I went off to study commerce and I just knew I wanted to be part of I guess this you know re- revolution that was happening around the internet and how that was going to change the way we did business as well We'll get into a bit about what you've achieved with Bird's Nest and the online um, and in getting ahead in the online space in a moment. But I just want to kind of um, go back to that moment of going back to Kuma because there was a little bit of, you've probably heard this before, a farmer wants a wife kind of situation. <laughs> <laughs> but, you're, you know, you, you've moved back to Kuma uh, for love. Um, how did your career goals change from when you moved back then? Because we've already talked a little bit about those opportunities increasing, but what were those opportunities like then? Yes, that's interesting. And and I will say that Ollie did give it a good go in the city. I dragged him to the city first. So he did have a crack um, with his little ag bite around the city, but we, we did end up back in a regional area um, and it, at that time it was so scary. I just really thought to move back to a, to a country town, I needed a ticket. Like I needed, I couldn't be, I couldn't just have these broad skills. I felt like I needed to have like, I needed to be a teacher or an accountant or, you know, to have some sort of professional qualification that said I could put up my sort of flag and say, this is what I do, or this is who I am and I can help. So at that time, I really thought I would become a teacher. I enrolled to do a dip ed. I actually did a careers counselling I went back to RMIT and did careers counselling and actually worked in a school for a year, which I loved because I just love that period of time when, you know, kids are looking out to the bigger world and trying to work out how they can make a contribution and fill the cup. So I love that thing. So I really thought that's what I would do. And um, and I think it was, you know, a classic case of I remember my sister ringing me and saying, what are you doing? I, I can't believe you're throwing away your whole degree. Um, and... And, yeah, I mean, it's a classic case of um, my favourite quote often in in, in kind of life and and business is that, you know, the Charles Darwin theory of evolution and, you know, it's not the strongest of the survive, it's not the smartest, but it's the one that's most adaptable to change. And I think as a little human that is something that I've um, I've really been able to lean into, like, um, and when you find yourself in the middle of nowhere, that's kind of what you need to do. And I think... And as a business, I think that's something we've really adapt. We've really kind of taken on as well that kind of receptiveness and and, and adaptability. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, it was it was a you know evolve or perish. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was going to be no good at str- like honestly. I mean, I've learned a little bit about chasing sheep around now, and a little bit about there is a full psychology to sheep and where to stand and how to get them to move and all that kind of stuff. But the dogs do a much better job than me, and I couldn't string a fence if I tried. My scones aren't that good, so I knew I needed to get off the farm and make a contribution in a different way. (laughs) No CWA for you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they do a great job, but um, and they do lots more than scones. But yes, I think I was. I if I was waiting, if I was at home each night, you know, hoping for compliments about what I how I manage the household and what I cooked that day, I knew that I would disintegrate. So, um, yeah, I had to get out there. So what planted the seed for the idea that would eventually become Bird's Nest? 
Well, I think, as I say, at the time I moved to Can- I tra- transferred my job with IBM at the time to Canberra and it was a great job, uh, but it was a lot of travelling. And so, you know, I just really wanted to make a financial contribution to the to the family and, you know, I was looking for my reason to jump out of bed each day. So initially it was really much more about my career and, and since has become much more about building, you know, careers for people in a regional area. Uh so it was one of those things where um, we just looked at a whole lot of businesses and, and this great business came up called High Country Outfitters. And so we bought an established business in 2004, which is how I fell into retail. And did you bootstrap it? Was it a family business, that investment? Uh, so actually, initially, I went into partnership with a girlfriend, a, a, um, a Canadian um who had also fallen in love with a cowboy, the man from Snowy River, we called him. He was a he was the true <laughs> horse riding, um, you know, um, sort of everything you imagine for a man from Snowy River. And um, and she moved her whole life from Canada to be here and we'd met in Canberra. So we actually, she, going into business together, she really gave me the confidence. So we did, um, and unfortunately that was, you know, the man from Snow River decided he was going to be, you know, he was going to go into real estate and other things. So they they actually moved away and that didn't, that was, that partnership was actually only four months in the end, but it got me into business. And yes, it was, it, we did bootstrap it and very quickly I was buying someone out. So we really had to, um, it was a family business um, at that time it was my husband and I, and then my parents came in at that time as 25% partners to get us going because we just put all our money into buying it. Then four months later, we were buying someone out of a business, which was very challenging um, financially. So, um, yeah, so my parents, for a long period of time, they said, when your first child hits high school, we we want to, you know, make sure that you're totally independent. So we, we had all that structured and we did bootstrap it from the beginning. Um, you know, I'm the daughter of an accountant. It was always, you know, make a profit, reinvest, make a profit, reinvest. So that's, and that's how we've run the business, which you know, in many ways has been great because we've been able to be in charge of our own destiny and 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 grow very organically. And how did it evolve from that high country outfitters to Bird's Nest? Right. Well, we had to change the name and that was terrifying um, at the time because it was this established business. It Honestly, it sold everything from, you know, uh, we... Uh, from R.M. Williams boots and Akubra hats was kind of, you know, the original core of it to saddlery and then fashion. And what I worked out quickly because I did have that background in accounting and 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 analysis was that the, the fashion part was the bit that was working. <laughs> so we got, you know, we just, we sold off the saddlery and we actually had a menswear store for a little while anyway and then we had to read we rebranded and made it all about women, and that's when um, Bird's Nest was born. Um, and so that was 2006, and then we went online in 2008. That's, I mean, that, when I look at Bird's Nest's story, uh, you, you started selling online, so that's like that's 14 years ago now. That was well before the boom in online shopping, and a lot of websites have been playing catch-up over the past couple of years. Uh, did you have a crystal ball, Jane? <laughs> I think I just had, uh, you know, you, there's so much luck that plays into everybody's, you know, into the paths that we take. Uh, and I think, you know, that that experience at university, you know, I was, I definitely wasn't scared of technology. And then I could see what was happening overseas where online shopping was a much bigger thing um, and was growing at a much faster rate than it was in Australia at that time, which was 2006. So that's when we started talking about it. And yes, of course, everyone said, Jane, don't be silly. Like, you've got to try a pair of jeans. No one's going to buy jeans or online. You've got to try them on. It's just never going to happen. So, um, yeah, so we really, um, and that, but that was to our advantage because of course we launched online and no one knew who Bird's Nest was, but we, we were representing 80 really well-known brands in Australia. So at the time it was sort of Jag and Esprit and Levi's, um, and everyone knew who those brands were. And so we were the trusted supplier. And, And for many years, as you say, you know, it was five years, I think, before Esprit and Jag went online in Australia. So we were, you know, we were one of the exclusive supplies for them online. Um, and we were lucky enough to, you know, to be able to grow through through that and grow we did quickly because <laughs> we were used, five when we started. That's was amazing. Five of us. <laughs> you, you used the word luck a few times. And I think you, 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 you're, you're not kind of giving yourself the credit there. It's not just luck. It's, it's very much a shrewd 
um, shrewd acumen and, you know, and research. Like you said, you're watching what was happening overseas. So there, I think yeah, luck is underplaying it. Oh, definitely. It's a combination of things, you know, that, that happens. Um, yes, but uh, like we were also at the time, you know, the, it's just timing and things is just all plays into, you know, to be at a moment in time when you're, you know, you're one of the first in market and, um, so, you know, all, all boats rise. <laughs> <laughs> and as rise Adam said, you've been in the online space for 14 years now. You must have seen a massive evolution since you began your journey. What are uh, some of the trends that you've seen that have stood out for you? Oh, right. Well, that that's just so constant. I mean, we were obviously a business that was 100% bricks and mortar. We're now... 95% digital and online and, and 5% through our store, which is still a fantastic store. It does a really great turnover in a small country town, you know, over 1.5 million in that little store. Um, so what, you know, and, you know, in terms of how people even reach out online, I mean, smartphones weren't even a thing when we started. I remember for one of our Christmas parties, we gave everyone a, a um their first iPhone, which was just so exciting. <laughs> and every, you know, and I just sort of think that we've gone from not having smartphones to them running our lives completely. Um, so, and just the tools have got so much better that we can use as a team. And um, I think it's mainly the evolution you go through as a business um, is where your learnings are. And, and every time you're challenged, that's when you learn. So, um, it's constant. I can't keep up with all the new acronyms, to be honest. <laughs> there's always there's always something new in e-commerce that I'm like, How, do you think I really need to do this or will it just be a passing fad? <laughs> but, uh, but what about the competition? Because there are so many brands nowadays that are vying for our eyeballs online and trying to get our e-commerce dollars. So have there been any mistakes that you've made when you've been trying to chase sales? Oh, I, look, we've made plenty of mistakes. We had to remember to put in a sales meeting because I, I, what I realised is all these other retail companies had sales meetings. <laughs> we didn't have one, I think. Um, so we've put one in now, which is good, but I think chasing sales is something that's not really been in my head. We've always been about, like, how do we create a really, like when we went online, it was like, how do we recreate the magic that was happening in those change rooms online? How do we, we know she comes into this purchasing decision with some sort of dilemma you know whether and that's what we really started we looked at how she you know was it was it um occasion driven like I've got the dreaded school reunion or I'm the mother of the bride or was it um a lot for women is around their body shape you know and it's an extremely vulnerable space the change room space you know and as women we're judged on our appearance from such an early age and I think you know what we were really trying to tap into is what are the what is the problem that we are like solving for her in that story environment? How do we translate that sort of magic that can happen if we create a safe and inclusive space? Because fashion can be quite uh, non. <laughs> um, it Brutal. can feel almost uh, yes, and none of the models smile. Everyone looks so unhappy. Um, so we were just like, you know, we want to we want to be a place where you land and feel much safer because then you, you're much more likely to explore this. And and um, so I guess we have just constantly focused on how can we create a space that looks a little bit different to what's available for women right now. Um, so that's hence why we've always had, you know, diversity in our models and, you know, we shoot we shoot the garments on different body shapes and sizes so that you can relate to, well, how's that going to look on me? I'm not a size eight or 10. So how's that going to look? Or is it, you know, we, we ask, um, you can fill out a style profile on our um, website, which will then curate our, like, so you can say, look, I'd never wear a play suit and I love this colour, but I don't like this colour. And, you know, and then we'll curate the range and say, I know it's overwhelming to get onto these sites, but here's the things that based on what you've said are your best fit. Um, and often when I work at, often when I, people say, oh, you're at Bird's Nest, I, I, that's a place that does all those outfits and shows me how to wear it. So, you know, what we realised very early on is we're not in a product game. I said, yes, we're selling frocks, but we very quickly realised we're in a service business and it's actually the way we differentiate ourselves is through the service that we provide around being the matchmaker between a girl and her perfect outfit. So uh, when, I'm, when we want to be better, we go, how do we be better at that? 
and then we generally that's how we make less mistakes <laughs> when i've literally just chased sales and, and, you know, you get into a state where you think, oh, maybe we should be growing faster. Let's go out, buy a heap more things. That's when we've got ourselves into trouble, when we've, like, focused on the wrong things. And and that's generally when you get overstocked or make other mistakes that, because you're not actually, you take your eye off what's important and you think sales are important, but actually, no, are you doing a better job than everyone else in making it easy for her to shop online? What's your returns policy like? What's How are you getting it to her faster? When she ordered the dress today, she really wanted it yesterday. So what are you doing to improve all of those things and the service around it? That's when I think we make smarter decisions. Gosh, it's such great advice. Sorry, that was a really long answer. (laughs) No, it's such great advice. We'll be back with more from Jane Kay after this very, very short break. This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. At Sax.com, it's easy to find your new vibe. Dive into the Western trend with gold cowboy boots from Stott or go full 90s throwback with platforms from Prada. You can shop for everything on your agenda, whether it's a breezy Zimmerman dress for a garden party or a bright Chloe blazer for brunch. Find inspiration for your new vibe every day at Saks.com. All right, and we're back now with Jane Kay from Bird's Nest. Now, Um, As you were talking about earlier, uh, you want to be the matchmaker for those girls looking for the perfect outfit. Well, one of the things about Bird's Nest is that it's known for being super inclusive, especially in your sizing and your brand marketing. What lessons do you think you've learned about putting diversity first? Oh, look, I think um, it probably starts with our team makeup. I think we have um, in our team, our ages range from sort of, you know, we've got people that help us after school from sort of 16 years old to my mum still does the underwear buying and she's just turned 70. So um, I think we've got diversity within our team. I think there's over 18 different nationalities represented in our team, which is pretty amazing in a country town of 6,500 that we have so much diversity and that's in ability as well. So I think it comes from the team and, and the voices in the team and I think we've always felt the responsibility of representing women to women. One of the things that was a real look in the mirror moment was when we um, partnered with Taryn Brumford, who runs the global body image movement, and she had uh, she produced a documentary, Embrace, and we got behind that. And she came and spoke with us and she did some work in our business and it really helped us lift our game and we we sort of we did an extra pledge at that time that says look there's some things that we were doing that we didn't sort of realize the damage of that for example we really want our models to smile so we were doing things like whitening their teeth so that they looked really smiley <laughs> um but then you know you start to turn 40 something like oh should my teeth be a little bit whiter than they are like to actually show something that wasn't real to a customer even though we weren't changing their body shape but we were changing their body so you know we pledged that we would no longer photoshop anything about someone's body or appearance so i think and, and our customers have really responded to that so i think being able to see it on different sizes. And the other thing that happened is about a big important step for our business was about eight years ago, nine years ago even now. We just, a lot of brands were only going to size 14 and that's for us, that's like, that's middle ground. You know, that's that's the average Australian size. So we were like, we really need you to extend your size range. And many did, but many didn't um, at that time. And so that's when we started actually producing our going from being a retailer solely of other people's products to actually creating and manufacturing our own labels where we could actually say, you know what, we're going to take this from a size six or eight right up to a size 22, 24. So, um, and then we could bring all, all those beautiful designs in, in, in everybody's size. One of the things that gave me so much joy just the on Bird's Nest website is um, I saw a friend of mine who's one of your models and her name's Lisa ah. Cox. Uh, and Lisa Cox, uh, she's an incredible uh, speaker and disability advocate. And it was just so refreshing to to see her there on, on your website. Yes, Lisa visited us recently and spoke to the whole team, which we all just completely, yeah, hung on every word that she had to say. Um, and it's, you know, it's so great to have teachers and people like Lisa that are out there and, um, you know, educating. And she, I mean, she, she was honest herself. She said, hopefully... Soon that won't even be needed because it'll just be so that that will just be our first, you know, um, our first way of thinking is to have 
in, in everything that we do and design in our work and life is how do we make sure that this that everybody is able to access this. Mm, yeah, totally. Now, on a bit of a like on related but slightly different note, I, I, I want to know what is the biggest selling bird's nest product to this day? Has there been one huge runaway hit that you can that you think of <laughs> any item of clothing? Well, look, I think coming out of the last couple of years that you know, pull on pants. <laughs> <laughs> I know that doesn't sound very sexy, but look, that we went from selling a lot of cocktail dresses to a lot of pull-on pants. But um, yeah, that that's been the most popular in the last couple of years. We have a blazer that's Australian-made. Um, it's called the Everyday Blazer, and honestly, that thing just they just love it. It's a it's under a hundred dollar Australian-made cotton blazer and it just goes and goes <laughs> sells itself as they say <laughs> yeah and in a zoom meeting all you need is just throw on a blazer and you, you're done <laughs> you can Keep leave your it. stretchy pants on underneath that's right all the, all the pajamas exactly you got your pull-on pants underneath <laughs> <laughs> on the flip side have you ever launched a product launched a product that you really believed in that you loved but it just didn't resonate with people Oh, look, yes. No, we call those the dogs. Um, there's <laughs> always, I mean, there's, you, you, you absolutely have to take, you know, you've got to take some risks in fashion always because I think, you know, we, we're very much more about just find the style and look that you you feel good in. You don't really need to be too trend-based. And um, so we encourage our customers to not, you know, necessarily be with the latest trends. So hopefully they're not making too many crazy um, faux pas. But, you know, occasionally you do need to take a risk to to sort of try the latest trends and sometimes they're just not necessarily good look. My my husband can't get, like Ollie can't get over the drop pants, drop crutch thing. He just, <laughs> and it, it's polarising. Like we've done a survey once on like what do you think of the crutch pants and our customers are like they either love them or hate them. <laughs> Well, look, if you do actually, if you do hate what you're sent by Bird's Nest, and I'm, I'm familiar with, you know, you, you were talking about like about how you get a personalised style guide that you can kind of, you fit in and you, you see yourself mm. as kind of the wardrobe angels where you kind of put together, somebody fills in their details, you know, I love a, I want some, I love the colour red, I love these styles, I love these sizes, I love all these kind of, you know, I love florals and that sort of thing. And then you've got, you, you get a kind of personalised guide to, you know, to Bird's Nest uh, products. But one the of the range. things that you you have is um you've always been very encouraging of online returns so if somebody doesn't like something that they've been sent it's always you've been very forgiving you're you're very much like open with people like you know what that's okay you can send it back how has that how has that attitude changed i guess as people obviously have been getting a lot more into online shopping and returning Oh, look, I think it's absolutely, I mean, really why my uh, my aunt who were, has worked in retail all her life wisely advised me at the beginning because people get a bit antsy about returns because obviously that's a sale coming back. But she she was great in sort of mentoring me around that is the last experience you have with a customer. It's so, so important and it's, you know, it's all about creating that safe environment, one, for them to take a risk on you and to take a risk on their wardrobe and try something new. So we've all, we've really lent into returns. We've, I think, got the most generous returns policy in Australia that I know of, it's, which is 365-day returns um, so that you can have a year to change your mind on something um, if you haven't worn it. And we've just introduced, actually, last week, lifetime returns. So we are now in our, you know, new state of evolution as everyone's starting to think about their wardrobes differently and how do we, you know, how do we make our clothes last longer? And, you know, quite often, um you know, you bought something, you loved it, but it, it either doesn't fit anymore or it's just didn't bring you the same joy it used to, as Marie Kondo would say. So, you know, what happens to those clothes? And we really want to take responsibility for everything we're bringing into the world. So we're saying, look, even if you've worn it, we will take it back and find it a new home. So we're just about to launch our rehatched business rehatch, which is online, which is our pre-loved offering. So very soon you'll be able to come onto our site and you'll be able to buy, you know, a new bra and then a secondhand, you know, pre-loved maxi dress. And what we're really trying to do is create kind of give everyone those first class experience, like often shopping for secondhand clothing can sort of be a little bit of a secondhand experience as well. So, you know, how do we create a first class experience for shopping for those things? Because that's how we're thinking about now. We're, we're thinking about how do we how do we have this rotating wardrobe and we're sort of like imagining this rotating bird's nest wardrobe amongst our community um, and thinking how we can now evolve to be part of that, 
you know, um, that solution because we're all trying to think about solutions for, for, the, for the challenges our, our planet faces. Yeah, that's great that you're adopting that circular approach because, as you said, the challenges of the planet, like fashion, is one of the biggest culprits in terms of landfill, isn't it? Well, yes, and it's hard when you wake up, you know, when you're 26 and you head into an industry. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know, I don't think any of us really understood climate change 20 years ago. So, um, I mean, there were people that did understand it, that they're just probably smarter than me. Um, so, yeah, so, to, you know, to it's, I guess it's just our latest, it's our latest challenge because, um, you know, sometimes I think, oh, my gosh, it's all too hard. I, You know, how, how do we... The challenges are so great, but then I remember we can't walk around naked um, and that <laughs> I have 140 people that we need to, you know, this is a business that needs to, you know, adapt as the whole industry does um, and we all do. We're all, you know, facing that in our individual lives. So if we can find ways to make those decisions easier because I think often the decisions we have to make that are good for the planet are inconvenient for our lives. Um, so what can we do to make it really easy for people to engage in, in consuming in different ways? Now, we've talked quite a bit about um, the bird's nest experience from a customer sense, but what about your staff? Because I read that bird's nest regularly makes it into the top 100 of best places to work. So how important is culture to the success of your business? Oh, look, I think that was one of – that was a very early lesson, that sort of culture uh, eats – uh, strategy for breakfast. I think, um, you know, you can't, you know, we're a team that, um, you know, wins innovation awards and customer service awards. And, you know, that's not because we're the smartest. I don't think, you know, we, um, get less than 10% of our team have a tertiary education, not to say that they're not really smart, but they just haven't done that kind of book learning. Um, what we do have is a team that really cares about what they do. They care about the people they work with, the role they do, and, the, and I think, you know, the world that we live in as well. And that care factor, like if you don't have that, you can have the best strategy in the world, but no one's going to be prepared to really go the mile that's going to execute it because it's all in the execution. Um, and if you want to innovate, you have to be prepared to be vulnerable. And I think um, it's very difficult to be vulnerable. Um, like I know for those Brené Brown tragics out there, she talks about like in the face of uncertainty and needing to innovate, you know, you have to put yourself on the line. And if you don't have a culture that feels safe, I think, you know, psycholo people, you know, in, in that world now talk about the importance of trust and psychological safety and if that's not there and you don't and you don't have a culture that um allows you to make mistakes and things then you can't try the new thing like but the moment we are like even trying to launch this new um rehatch initiative there's so many complications and barriers and difficulties and like you know you've really got to lean in to making mistakes to get it up and going um and so therefore you know, a happy team equals, you know, like that, that's, I, I realised really early as part from wanting a great place to come into work that actually it was really important for our business that, that we had a team that wanted to get out of bed and come into work as well. So you talked a little bit about that vulnerability and the safe space. Now, a few years ago, you did a feedback to feed forward exercise where you got your staff to evaluate you as a leader. Now, can you tell me a bit about that process and um, how it made you change your leadership style? Yeah, sure. I think um, at that time we were about 80 people and I really thought, you know, it's like the classic founder gets to a point and thinks, actually, I'm out of my league. I think I need to hand this over to a you know, someone that actually is a grown-up and knows what they're doing. And I was at that point completely strung out, burnt out. And I was pretty snappy and I just, um, and th at that point, yes, I got a coach and they, I got this feedback. And I think the thing that I learned was when I was in a, when I was in a good state of mind and everything worked well, the team really loved working together, but when I was stressed and that's when I, I remember Googling on one New Year's Eve, like, how do I calm down? 
and all this stuff. And this was this was actually nearly nine years ago. Um, all this stuff on mindfulness came up before it was trendy. Like I swear that was it was just for hippies then meditation. Um, and I was like, oh, no, what? I'm not. No, please tell me this is not the answer. Um, and I remember going off to a mindful leadership retreat, which was so incredible because it was not only sort of the ancient wisdom stuff but all the neuroscience stuff which I didn't know I didn't know how my brain worked I was never taught that at school I didn't understand that when I was stressed I actually couldn't access the part of my brain that had rational and compassionate thinking so therefore it was impossible for me to be a good leader and be stressed at the same time so understanding that all of a sudden it wasn't cool to be stressed and super busy and not sleeping enough and you know that actually it was it was counterintuitive to me being a good leader was such a gift at that time and and you know we've really brought that education and that practice into the business and it's been incredibly powerful and life-changing for individuals as well as you know profound for the business in terms of where it's moved us in our level of sort of consciousness um, and awareness I think. We're pretty. We're in a really good time in the sense that health and well-being have become, you know, I suppose they've become buzzwords in business. Um, and I think you know the pandemic certainly brought that to the the forefront of a lot of people's minds. You know, going you you know your your people are going through you know a really unusual, uh, you know, once in a lifetime, hopefully only once in a lifetime kind of moment where this is really impacting their mental health. Um, what. What do you look? What do you do to look after your mental health now? Is that mindfulness element really very key to how you go about running the business today? Look, I think yeah, it's a combination of things for different people. For for me personally, um, you know, uh, it's it's sleep first and foremost. I, I realize you know a problem can seem so huge. <laughs> in the evening when you've had a big day and insurmountable and then after a sleep and potentially a walk ideally as well all of a sudden you can think of two or three ways in which you could attack it you know so I I, to actually tangibly see the difference you know now that I'm observing it is so amazing so yes and then yes I do have you know a yoga practice and uh you know, um, but look, you know, I think that's one of those things I'm still, I'm still a work in progress. I dip in and out of it. Um, sometimes you can intellectualize this stuff and but actually it, it takes the practice. You've got to get on your mat, get out the door, put your joggers on, get into bed on time. It's habit forming. And I think, you know, like, um, recently read that atomic habits book, and that's a really good one for, you know, habitizing these things that we know we should do. Oh, I love that recommendation. Yes. I'm gonna. I'm writing it down right now. <laughs> <laughs> but Jane K, thank you so much for sharing your first act with us today. Now, if you want to learn more about Bird's Nest, head to birdsnest.com.au for the best in Aussie women's fashion from Jane and her team. And of course, thank you for joining us for another episode of First Act. We'll be back in your ears next week with another guest and a great conversation. We look forward to your company. <laughs>